Chapter 10 Ladies and gentlemen, Rod Temple, the auctioneer, stood on a hay wagon, microphone to his mouth to get everyone's attention. If I could just have everyone come over to me, I have an announcement I would like to make. And, contrary to popular opinion, I don't like to hear myself speak. So let's get everyone here, and then I can say this only once and not have to repeat myself. Sterling watched in confusion as the crowd gathered, buzzing over the unorthodox opening of the auction. Usually, Temple just said the terms and conditions of the sale and then got on with it. Dixby came to stand beside her, Joy sitting on his shoulders. Dixby, you keep carrying that child. She will never learn to walk, run, or make it on the field hockey team, Sterling said dryly as she reached out a hand to straighten Joy's dress. She runs just fine. Dixby frowned at Sterling. Some days I can barely keep up to her. I like running, Joy piped up as she strangled some more of Dixby's hair into a tiny ponytail, complete with colorful elastics. It's fun. How did you manage to have such a cute kid? Sterling smiled at Joy, who smiled back happily. She is all her mother, Dixby said confidently, ignoring the tugging of his hair. All right, everyone, Temple called their attention back to him. The equipment was supposed to be auctioned off today in the farm if the minimum bid was met. There's been a change of plans, as the auction has been cancelled as of this morning. Someone has stepped in and offered the bank a tidy sum for the whole lot, and that offer has been accepted. I'm sorry if that some of you folks drove all the way from Buford or beyond, and as an act of goodwill, lunch at the fry truck will be paid for. Thank you for coming to Pendle for the auction. If you require an auctioneer for estates or livestock sales, please contact me, Rod Temple at Temple's Auctioneering Company. Have a good day, folks. Temple turned off the microphone and jumped off the wagon as the crowd began talking, gossiping amongst themselves at this turn of events. Several people had already wandered over to the fry truck, forming a line. Some headed for their cars. Most just hung around, ready to talk for a while. I wonder who bought it, Sterling said softly. It's hard to imagine anyone here would have the cash for a straight-out purchase this big. Who is that talking to your parents? asked Dixby, even though he already knew. He had spotted Jake talking to Paisley and Owen Hawkins a while ago. Paisley was wiping her eyes with a tissue, and Owen looked a little gobsmacked. Sterling sucked in a breath as her traitorous feelings took a leap of joy at the sight of Jake. I can't believe it! He bought the farm! Seems that way, Dixby commented with a smile. That low-down, sneaky scumbag! Sterling exploded, marching toward Jake as quick as her crutches would allow. She ignored the pain of her knee as she put weight on it to get there more quickly. Wait, what? Dixby followed her. This was going to be a show if he was any judge of the situation. Coolies never missed a show if they could help it. You! Sterling poked Jake in the leg with a crutch. You're despicable. First you fire me, shut down my tabloid, then blacklist me so I could never get another job in my field. But that was not enough, was it? You are so set on revenge that you had to buy my parents' farm, then taunt them with the news. You were the worst person on this planet, Jake Ramsley. Whatever Jake had to say was lost as he quickly backed away from Sterling, who tried to hit his loafered foot with her crutches as she continued her tirade. How dare you! I was doing my job, just like every other tabloid reporter. While I might have accentuated the truth, I never once lied about your family in the articles. Yet for some reason, you singled me out to destroy my career. The only thing I can think you would have against me is that I lied about being a flight attendant to get on that plane. I saved our lives on more than one occasion after that crash. You would think you might be a little bit grateful? Maybe even forgive me for having to write about your family in my articles? But no. Instead, you go ballistic. You are the worst sort of autocrat, bully, tyrant, dictator. Sarah Lee Caroline Hawkins, Paisley said sharply as Sterling paused for breath. Owen handed his daughter a paper with a trembling hand. Sterling glared at Jake one last time before taking the paper and having a look. It was the deed for the farm, transferred back to her parents from the bank. She felt her anger drain away, being replaced by confusion. I don't understand. He's bought the farm and has given it back to us, Owen said in surprise. Why? 
Sterling felt bewildered. You are right, Jake admitted. Part of him was surprised by her tirade. He knew he deserved it, yet no woman had ever stood up to him that way before. It was refreshing. Plus, she was magnificent in her anger, her eyes bright and cheeks flushed. Jake cleared his throat and concentrated on an explanation. I was wrong to interfere in your career. I was wrong to hurt you like that. This is my way of making amends. If I had not caused you to lose your job and not be able to get another, you would have been able to make the payments and not have lost the property. Every insult you said about me, or even thought about me, I deserve. I'm sorry. Sterling stared at Jake in shock. Never had she expected him to apologize. It put her off balance for a moment. Buying the farm is easy for you. It was an easy thing to just spread your money, ask for forgiveness, and leave. What about the people of Pendle? What about my career? Jake nodded at Sterling's calm questions. I've talked to several of the other magazines, newspapers, and tabloids. I've asked them to ignore my earlier request not to hire you. Sterling, you can choose to work for whoever you wish, or I have another idea if it suits you. I still have all the assets from Dubious. If you want, you can run the place. Change the direction of the tabloid or keep it the same. I don't care. I'll fund it. As for Pendle, I think the furniture factory should reopen. The business model that Brandt has slowly been implementing is viable. The biggest problem that the company was laboring under is so much debt. If the debts were removed, it could turn a profit, explained Jake. I've decided, if Mr. Hawkins is amenable to a partnership between the three of us, to invest in Hawkins' fine furniture. I believe that in the long term, the company could flourish. Sterling did not know how she was supposed to stay mad at him, even though she wanted to. Once the town learned of his sponsorship, he was going to become the town hero for saving jobs and Pendle itself. The Hawkins family had worked so hard as a family to keep things going, and here was Jake, with his bank account, saving the day without even blinking an eye over what had been insurmountable for the Hawkins family. It wasn't fair. Yet at the same point, Jake did not need to have to have done any of this. He could have just let it all collapse and never look back. None of this would have touched him. It meant that he was sincere in his apology. Why? Why did you do it? Sterling asked again. Why even go through that much work to destroy my career? I admit that I was angry. I felt that you'd been lying to me the entire time in pursuit of a story. I felt betrayed because I'd really started to enjoy your company. I liked you. Jake frowned at the memory, reluctant to confess his feelings, but Dixby had coached him that if he wanted to succeed in this, then Jake was going to have to tell Sterling how he felt. I had intended to ask for your phone number to stay in contact afterwards. I felt that we had a connection. I thought that you might have had feelings for me as well. Jake sighed as he debated how to frame his next words. Being a Ramsley is not always the easiest thing. People tend to want something from me. I'm constantly looking for an ulterior motive. It was refreshing to think that you had none. And then you found out that I did, Sterling said glumly. Yes. I was furious, Jake acknowledged. I was sick of the tabloids profiting off my family. I was angry that my father and Michael's reputations were being shredded. Mostly I was mad at myself for being duped by you. Instead of dealing with that anger, I directed it at you and Dubious. I dealt with you like I would anyone who'd cross me in the business world, since I expected that you had viewed our interactions as business only. Worse than that, I honestly felt like you had been laughing at me. Here I was, starting to fall for you, when you were just doing your job, trying to get picture and an article. It stung my pride. What I did, blacklisting you, was inexcusable. Buying dubious and shutting it down was a bad move, both financially and because it hurt you. Again, I apologize for my conduct. I was wrong to do that, and I hope by helping your family I can restore everything I took from you. Jake continued. I understand now that you were desperately trying to keep your parents' company functioning. I understand why you had to write those articles, and I have to admit that you do have a flair for the written word. I don't expect you to forgive me. I'll give Mr. Hawkins and your brother my business advice, but mostly I expect to be a silent partner. 
If you want to take over Dubious, you will have full reign and I'll just fund it. You'll never have to see me again. Jake regretted the offer as soon as he made it. However, he knew that he had to respect Sterling's wishes. If she did not want to see him, then he would not see her again. It was that simple. He fervently wished that she would want to talk to him again, not just because he wanted her help with clearing Michael's good name. Jake intended to do what was right this time. Sterling thought over Jake's confession. He said he had started to fall in love with her. Sterling hugged those words to herself, trying to absorb them. Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins, I will be in touch. Jake shook Owen and Paisley's hands. He turned to Sterling. Sarah. Or Sterling. I guess this is goodbye. Maybe not. Sterling decided it had probably taken a lot of courage for him to admit that he was wrong and apologize. Men like the Ramsleys generally did not have to do that. The fact that he had humbled himself before her and done so much for her family as restitution meant that Jake was making an effort to right his wrong. Despite his eloquent speech, she could see that he was not used to apologizing and was embarrassed to be doing so in front of their parents. Sterling decided she could meet him halfway. I like you too. Ignoring the nervous beating of his heart, Jake focused on Sterling. Do you think that maybe we could start over? Just talk, get to know each other. Perhaps go out on a date. I would like that, admitted Sterling. She gave Jake a tentative smile, which he returned. There is something else. Jake thought it best to get everything out in the open. Sterling's stomach dropped and her smile faded. She waited patiently for what he might say. I was wondering if you might help to try to clear Michael's name. You have resources that my family doesn't. You could speak to your contacts at the FBI or elsewhere to find out if there's any evidence that will help him, asked Jake. I would appreciate any help you could give. She digested his words, anger building up. Did you just do all this to manipulate me into helping you? Is that what this whole thing was about, using me and my sources for your cousin? No, Jake protested quickly. It was not the way it is. Even if you don't want to help Michael, I meant every word I said. I still want to see you and get to know you better, Sterling. It's Sarah, she said curtly, wondering at his motives. Forget I said anything. Jake put his hands on her arms with a beseeching look. Let me buy you lunch. We can get to know each other better. You can tell me what it's like growing up in Pendle while I fill you in on what it's like growing up at a Ramsley. Please? It was the please that convinced her. Jake was being truthful. Sterling decided to tell him about what she had already done. I already agreed to try to help Michael. I gave evidence to Drew Colburn about David Ramsley. It is perhaps enough for the police to start an investigation into David. I'm not sure how my sources are going to be of any help to Michael, though. Drew Colburn? Jake furrowed his brows, trying to place the familiar name. Your cousin? Sterling said dryly. He's David's son from an affair with Margaret Colburn. Jake nodded as he remembered. He's the police officer. A detective, Sterling confirmed. Thank you for agreeing to help Michael. He's innocent of what they're trying to accuse him of, Jake responded, grateful that she was going to help. I noticed you didn't ask me to help with trying to clear your father. She looked at him for an explanation. That's because he admitted to his guilt. Jake did not hesitate to tell her. Everyone would know soon enough when Robert entered his plea in the court. Jake, Sterling said in sympathy as she took his hand, I'm so sorry. He shrugged. Jake would be there however he could for his dad, despite what his father had done. He loved Robert. It also meant that there's going to be a big fallout for the company. Everything is going to change. Yes, Sterling agreed. If you're nice to me, I'll stick around and face it with you. Then I'll have to make sure I'm nice to you. Jake gave her hand a squeeze. Why don't the two of you go down to the milk box and enjoy lunch? Dixby decided to interrupt. I'm going to organize the troops and get your parents moved back to their own home. That sounds like a really good idea, Paisley slipped her arm into her husband's. I know we'll look forward to being back in our own house again. Are you sure you don't want us to help? questioned Sterling. You two go and enjoy yourselves, Paisley was determined. 
She could see where this might head, and she liked the idea of Jake for a possible son-in-law at a future date. Shall we? Jake offered to Sterling. I have it on the best authority that the milk box is the only place to get ice cream. The best authority? Sterling raised an eyebrow. Joy told me so. Jake smiled at the little girl who was still perched on Dixby's shoulders. Well, then, it must be true, Sterling declared. Jake escorted Sterling as she crutched along beside him. How long until you can walk without crutches? The doctor wants to wait a couple weeks and then start physical therapy. What happened to your car? Sterling asked in disbelief. The rental was covered with dried dirt and mud. The front bumper dented, and the windshield had at least three sizable stone chips. Oh, Dixby and I went mudding, Jake said casually as he unlocked it. Mudding? Sterling looked up at Jake and surprised. He really did not seem the type. In a car! A farmer named Rudley had to pull it out with his tractor, he admitted as he opened the passenger door for her. I expect the rental company's not going to be very pleased. When did you meet Dixby? wondered Sterling. Yesterday. He was kind enough to give me a country tour. Jake grinned. He took Sterling's crutches, setting him in the back seat as she got comfortable. He even let me stay overnight at his place. He filled me in on all sorts of interesting things about your childhood. Remind me to have a word with him later? Sterling rolled her eyes. I'm so glad the two of you are getting along. I think I'm going to like spending holidays here. That is, if we do continue dating. Jake gave Sterling a sideways look as he settled behind the wheel of the car. You don't happen to have a flare gun on you. No? Sterling frowned at him. Why would you even ask that? Well, Dixby told me why you threatened him with one, Jake responded. I would hate for the same thing to happen to me if I start talking about a future with you. I'm going to have a word with Dixby about sharing personal stories. Sterling gave Jake a little shove on his arm, then looked at him in surprise. Does that mean you want a future with me? Does the idea make you want to point a flare gun at me? Jake asked, watching her intently. I like the idea, Sterling said softly. Jake smiled as he leaned over to give her a kiss. Sterling happily returned it. If you enjoyed Chapter 10 of Stranded with the Billionaire, Book 6 of the Ramsley Book Series, look for the epilogue coming soon. Think about sharing this video. Hitting the share to other social platforms can help other people find this channel. It helps with YouTube algorithms, and it also helps me grow my audience. It's an easy, free thing for you to do. Thank you so much for listening.